lot of things are different this year. Obviously, we don't have the uh, watermelon festival coming up. Like normally, we're all kind of getting the float ready and all that like we do, and that's going to be strange. They may have it later in the year, uh, from what I hear. I don't know if that will work out or not. And then summer camp for um, young people has been canceled. Um, maybe we'll be able to do something just with our kids, go somewhere and spend a few days and preach at them. The camp facility, they had all these regulations. They're like, well, if you come, then you got to have so many chaperones per kids, and then the kids have got to have this much space, so you have to have... It was just all these, these you know, outrageous uh, rules, and so spacing, you know, you couldn't eat but with the people that came with you. You couldn't have games with, with the people in your dorm, so you can't have summer camp without everybody touching everybody. So, I mean, uh, that's just not going to happen this year, so that's a lot different. I mean, 2020 has been different, hasn't it? We had a good revival. Brother Spurgeon came in, blew it in, blew it up, and blew it out, and it was good, and then the bottom dropped out and then all this stuff happened so who knows what the rest of the year will I'm not going out to California this year of course I wasn't going to get, get to go anyway because it was the same time as our camp and I'm not going to leave our kids but uh, so that wasn't going to happen so I don't even know if they're having church out there yet um, but so everything's different but we'll get through it and I'm glad to be able to have what we have I'm glad that you're able to come and whatever risk you might be taking by walking outside, <laughs> you know, who knows? I'm glad you're here. I'm glad I'm not just preaching at the camera. But it's a blessing. All right, let's open up to Second Timothy chapter number three. Second Timothy chapter number three. This is a great passage because for New Testament Christians to understand the signs of the times, this would be one of the passages we would go to. Not Matthew chapter 24, which is prophetic passages dealing with the nation of Israel. 2 Timothy 3 is aimed specifically at us in the church age, so this is good material for us tonight. 2 Timothy chapter number 3 will begin in verse number 1. Let's just read the whole chapter. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and leave captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the, truth, the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and, rather, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, and do all good works. Lord, we thank you for the text. We pray that you might help us now to get what we need as believers, especially in these times, to move forward in our Christian walk with Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Obviously, Paul is writing to warn Timothy about some things, and he's bringing these things to light. And as we look into the passage, obviously there's an awareness of perilous times. He says in verse 1, This know also. 
So the idea is to make you aware of something, to bring it to your attention. Timothy, you need to know something here. There will be some perilous times coming. And we need to be aware of the times. They say be aware of your surroundings. I'm bad about that. I'll be pumping gas and I'll be looking at a little... Just lost in my little David world and not even realizing if somebody's got a gun pointed at my head about to kill me or whatever. But they say you should be aware of your surroundings. The Bible uses the term walk circumspectly. That's like circle. That's like, you know, kind of being aware of what's going on, like a circumference. You're kind of looking around and you're aware of what's happening. So there's a, an awareness of the times. Back in the Old Testament, there was a group of the children of Issachar, 1 Chronicles chapter 12. The Bible said they were men which had understanding of the times. And it reminds me of some of those men back in the reign of Ahasuerus that had understanding of the times. The Bible says in the book of Esther, the king said to the wise men which knew the times. In other words, they had some discernment about them. They could survey and evaluate what was going on around them and make an assessment and make a judgment. By the way, you need to judge things that are going on around you. You say, how do I judge things? By my great intellect? No, you judge them by the scriptures. But there's an awareness. Jesus made the statement in Matthew 16. He says... Oh, ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the sign, signs of the times? And Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, Of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. So obviously, we are to be aware of perilous times. Now, there are different levels, I think, of peril. We're sitting in here tonight fairly comfortable. We're not in afraid of maybe the National Guard coming in, shutting us down, it's claiming that we're participating in hate speech. Not yet. Uh, we're not forbade to preach certain texts out of the Bible because they are, according to some groups, hate speech. Not yet. We are in our nice, comfortable, plush pews with air conditioning and have money in the bank and still have jobs. Still. So the level of peril can be different. Just like sometimes you can have first world problems and you can be depressed with all these blessings around you and you can have first world problems. I get that. But we need to be aware and cognizant of perilous times. Notice here in the text the affections of perilous times. You'll notice in verse number 2, unnatural love. Boy, if that's not a sign of the time. In all kind of ways. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. You know, it's not natural for a mother to be more concerned about herself than her child. It's not natural for a group of people to want to save the spotted owl, but they kill the unborn. That's not natural. Amen. 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 Unnatural affections. Lovers of sin instead of the Savior, verse number 4. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That's what's wrong with the Laodicean church, even Bible-believing churches. We think more, we act more, we do more with the things of, that involve pleasure and the things of this world than we do spiritual things. So we see the unnatural love, we see the unbridled lust. Look in verse number 2. Disobedience, disrespect. Boy, we're seeing that today. Disrespect toward man, disrespect toward God. Notice not just boasters and proud, but blasphemers. Not just disobedient to parents, but blasphemers. It's one thing to get mad at a preacher, get mad at another Christian, but when you're spouting out that venom toward God, that's another thing. Notice also the depravity there in verse number 3. The without natural affection, all those things that go in, in with that. You see not just the affections of perilous times, but verses 3 and 4, the actions of perilous times, pride, perversion, propaganda. Look in verse number 4. Traitors, heady, high-minded, having a form of godliness. Now here's the appearance of perilous times. Things are better, right, than they were, let's say, in 1920. <laughs> things are better. Well, with technology and travel, things are better. Here's another uh, appearance of perilous times. All things will just cruise on just like they are. <laughs> I think our world's been shaken up a little bit to try to say, you know, 
Your life as you know it may never get back to as you know it, or it's, it very well may change drastically from this point on. Another appearance of perilous times in verse number 5 is the appearance that people still love God and worship God. Now, if you were privy to some of the lessons that we gave on salvation, I think you understood the line that we drew when we gave some of the statements of faith from these other churches. You realize millions of people who attend church on a regular basis are lost and on their way to hell, and they say they love God. Say, I love God and I'm going to church. Okay, what do you have to do to get to heaven? Well, you've got to be baptized and you've got to go to church. Wrong. You're not even saved. The same people that say that, they're all for these things that the Bible's against. No wonder, therefore, that these churches are now for the things that the Bible's against because a lot of them are not even converted. But they have an appearance of loving God. They can all sing amazing grace even though they don't understand it. And then the apostasy of perilous times, verses 7 and 8. Here it is, education without answers. Ever learning. We have more information now. Information is not the problem. <laughs> education without answers. And then verses 8 and 9, reprobation without remedy. Reprobate, verse number 8, concerning the faith. Now this age, verse number 13, is really my text. This is my title. When it gets worse, that's my title. It is going to get worse. Verse number 13, here's how our age ends. Evil men and seducers shall wax, look at it, worse and worse. Now tell that to the fundamentalist, independent Baptists who claim that we can very well see another nationwide revival. That's Paul's comment on how this age ends. It's going to get worse and worse. So I'm not looking for nationwide revival. Whatever type of great awakenings we've had in this country in the past, I don't see that happening toward the end of the age. Now maybe we're still a couple hundred years off. I don't think so, but toward the end of the age, I believe, as we see, it's going to get worse and worse. Isaiah 59, verses 13 and 14, he says, In transgression and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, and judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. That's exactly where we live. Truth does not matter. What matters is propaganda. What matters is what something has been told over and over and over, and that takes precedence. Now, I'll give you a few things. The things are going to get worse. What's the answer for us? Well, the answer for us is to react in a biblical way. Um, we're, I don't think that uh, we're going to go get the glory days back. I don't think the rainbow is ever going to come off the White House or whatever house you have. They say you go in Washington and you see rainbows all over the place. So what is that? That's the sodomy sign. It used to be a biblical sign, but now it's turned into the sodomy sign. You're never going back from that. It's done. It's over. Perversion rules the day, and it's not going to change. You say, well, we're going to make America the great Christian nation as it was. Well, I can argue with you that it never was, quote, unquote, a Christian nation. But that's a whole other argument for another day. What are we going to do? Take your gun and fight and bring the glory days back? You're not bringing the glory days back. Whatever is your conception of glory days. So what's the biblical answer? Well, I think it's right here in the text. Aren't you so great the Bible gives us the, the answers? You know, it's so neat that, that we have examples, we have illustrations from the Old Testament. Then we have prophetic passages like this that address perilous times. And within the text, I think it gives us some real good biblical counsel. Number one, here's what to do. Be aware of the perilous times, but forbear. Be aware, but forbear. Verses 1 through 5, we don't have to read it again. Knowledge is good. You should be aware, like I mentioned. Look, I'm the world's worst for not being informed as far as what's going on. You know, if it's raining, I'll find out it's outside. I can see it. Um, but I, I, and I give you advice. Listen to as very little news as you can because it will help keep your sanity. You know, I mean, you need to know, you know, what day of the week it is, I guess. But outside of that, you know, try to stay focused on the Lord. Be aware, but forbear. Here's some verses. 
Proverbs 1 verse 4, he says, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. That's a positive. In other words, you should have some knowledge, so therefore you can make a correct evaluation. But making an evaluation or a judgment without facts is kind of just a waste of time. That's what a lot of people like to do. But he mentions knowledge, and we should have knowledge. Proverbs 19, verse number 2, Also that the soul be without knowledge, it is not good. And he that hasteth with his feet sinneth. In other words, you hear something from one obscure source, so then you just run in that direction. Well, let's, don't be so hasty here. Let's find out you know, if the source is reliable or not, and let's use a little discernment. Jesus said in Matthew 15, he said, Let them alone, speaking of the Pharisees, they be blind, leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. There's a lot of that going on. You know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. There's the right kind of knowledge and the wrong kind of knowledge. I preached a whole message on that several weeks back, so I won't get into that again. But here's really the, 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 uh, the, the, the point of this. Don't meddle in the madness. That's the point of it. Verse number 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Look at it. From such connect. From such engage. From such absorb. You just can't stay off the social media. You just can't stay away from the TV. You just can't stay away from the newspapers. Whatever it is, you've got to be in the know. You say, what is that? That's Athenian Christianity. And I can feel the pushback from this. It's like you're trying to, you know, you're hitting the roots as you're trying to dig up the, dig the stuff up. Because you just want to know what's going on. That's a, that's a part of your sin nature. Now years ago, it was a telephone. You know, somebody getting on the phone, talking about so and so. Running their mouth, running their mouth, running their mouth, running their mouth. It's not the tongue anymore, now it's the thumbs. It's not the TV anymore. It was the computer. Now it's the phones. And so the idea is to don't meddle in the madness. There's a lot of this in here. You're in, uh, you're in Timothy, so go ahead and take a, uh, just a left turn real quick to chapter 2. Look at it in chapter number 2. Look at this admonition here in verse number 23. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. Here's what you have to do when you... You have to choose your hill to die on, by the way. And I think our hill to die on is the cause of Jesus Christ. That's our hill to die on. And you've got to choose your hill to die on. At the end of the day, you have to look beyond the emotion. And you have to look beyond the strife and the opinions and somebody ticking you off because their opinion doesn't match your opinion. And you've got to say, what's, what's the end of this deal? There are even some doctrines that they're kind of minute things and different people have different ideas. They're not hard, fast. There are some people, they will choose to die on that hill and they'll make a perfectly good enemy out of a perfectly good Christian brother or sister. They can't look beyond their pet peeve because their whole goal is, like in the text, boasting and pride. I am right and I'm going to find somebody to agree with me and I'm going to put somebody else down so I can put myself up. That flesh, that pride rises up. You're in uh, Timothy. Take a left turn and go back to 1 Timothy chapter number 6. There's a lot of this in Paul's epistles here. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. The best thing to do in this time, especially if those of you that have to deal with people out in the world with all these issues, try to take these issues and make it a witnessing opportunity. Just turn it back on Jesus Christ. You know, just flip the whole thing around. And don't even get into all the scuffle. Because number one, you're probably not going to convince them against their opinion anyway. But at least you can give them the gospel. All right, look in 1 Timothy chapter number 6. Verse number 5. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. Look at this exhortation. From such withdraw thyself. He's speaking of proud people. Verse number 4. Those that are questioning, those that are 
they're arguing with strife and envy, verse number 4. He says, from such withdrawal. All through here. Titus 3, verse 10, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. Over in Romans chapter 16, he says, Mark them that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and argue with them. No. He says, and avoid them. You, you make a note of it. You say, you know, they're not lining up with the Bible, and I can make that discernment. I can make that judgment. Now I'm going to stay away from that. That's the best way to handle it. <laughs> Be aware, but forbear. Come back to 2 Timothy. A couple more here and we'll be done. Notice in verse number, verses 10 to 12, as Paul works through this, he mentions the conflict that Moses had with Janus and Jambres, which their names aren't given in the Old Testament. Those were the, the, um, the magicians of Pharaoh that had the incantations and so forth. And he makes a statement, they'll proceed no further. Thou hast fully known my doctrine. He contrasts this in verse number 10. He's trying to encourage Timothy. Look, you've got a mentor. You've got some other people you can look up to as we're going through things. So now take what we've done when we've had to deal with conflict, when we've had to deal with this kind of stuff, and learn from us. And so he mentions himself in verse number 10, and then he mentions the persecutions that he went through. This is my second thing. And I believe one day later on, I will probably preach this message again later on down the road, maybe if the Lord tarries years from now, because this is definitely going, I believe, become applicable. Number two is expect persecution. Yeah. Expect it. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 10, Jesus said, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. I'm not talking about you know, somebody just saying, Ah, you Bible thumper. I'm talking about where you're, you can be arrested. I'm talking about where you could be threatened if you attend a certain church because of a certain church's belief. I don't believe we're too far down the road. Maybe, I hope I'm wrong. Expect it. Christians around the world, as we speak, and you can look it up, you can get newsletters. There are organizations that try to support the martyrs across their places in India. There are places in, in Muslim countries. There are places in communist China where in, in uh, North Korea where Christians are sought out and persecuted and killed for their faith. It's always been that way. And we've had a reprieve for a couple of hundred years here in America. And I believe that is going to, to leave. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 15, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant's not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Now here's what you need to understand. A lot of the stuff we're seeing now in our society has always been there. It's just been given rise and opportunity to come to the surface. A lot of times you'll see that in your own body. You'll have some type of physical problem, but it doesn't manifest itself until other symptoms and different things take place. And then it manifests. You ever have, you know, like an injury, and then you're on your feet for a long time, a particular day, and then that injury, it, it surfaces? It's the same type of thing. The evil is inside of man's heart. The violence and the wickedness and the perversion and the lies. The heart of man, your heart and my heart, is deceitful above all things. So whatever source you're going to, their material, their information can be wrong. You say, why? Because at the heart of the matter is a wicked, deceitful heart. And then the violence and the wickedness and all the stuff that we've seen in our world, you know, there's always people killing people. The stuff's just showing itself. It's just manifesting itself. Here's what you have to understand, that right now, even in our peaceful, loving society, as peaceful as it is as far as Christians go, there are people right now that if they had legislation behind them and if they had the ability to influence legislation, they would have us locked away for what we believe. There are thousands, tens of thousands of people in this country that would do that. And if you don't think, if you don't, you think I'm crazy, just, just mark my words. Expect persecution.
this is a very great positive message. I'm glad it's going over so well. Maybe uh, the First Baptist Church of every city will invite me to preach this in their congregation. I'm sure they will. Expect persecution. They refuse, number one, God's love. They resist, number two, God's truth. You see it in the passage. Men of reprobate minds, they resist the truth. And here's what they do, number three. Because sin always has to manifest itself. You ever have certain feelings inside and then, you know, you know if you get to talking about it, you're going to say something you shouldn't say? It's kind of like, you know, the guy I pulled out in front of you. You, you really need to cool off before you pull beside him at the next light. <laughs> because you might use the Hawaiian good luck sign. <laughs> it's like... Uh, that's in there. What happens with people that resist the truth and refuse God's love, especially when they're fed lies and propaganda about the truth? They believe certain things about Christians and certain things about Bible believers that aren't even true. They've invented these false truths. It's called a fixed false truth. It is a delusion in psychology. You have people walking around deluded. Because they're believing something that's not true about people. And therefore, what happens? Eventually, that's got to come out. So what does it lead to? You refuse God's love. You resist God's truth. You retaliate on the only ones you can. That's God's people. You can't kill God. God's not in front of you. But you sure can take it out on God's people. And they will persecute Christians. And if that does happen, you need to know these verses. Uh, over in 1 Peter, he says, think it not strange. <laughs> you know, he's like, what are you doing getting all whacked out because you're, you know, you had to get beat a few times. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. We think about fiery trials. We think about we didn't get the job promotion or, you know, our, we didn't get, you know, our lawnmower broke down or something. You know, I'm going through a trial. I had to sharpen my lawnmower blades. No, man. A fiery trial is when they take you out and they whip you and beat you and try to get you to deny Christ. And when you don't, they take your kids and kill them in front of you. That's what Christians have went through all through church history. And they're even going through in the world today. He says, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. That's why there's so much material in the New Testament about this because Christians were being persecuted. And Paul makes the statement, all that live godly, look at it in verse 12, in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. In light of that, what do we do? Verses 14 and 15, number 3. Keep doing right. He says, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Keep doing right. Verse 14, follow good examples. The Lord has given all of us good mentors. Other Christians that we know of, that we can say, you know, they've gone through some troubles and trials, we can follow them. Also, when we speak along these broad lines, these general ideas of, of persecution and conflict, we know that Christians throughout all the ages have gone through this. And it take, helps us to realize... Jesus Christ was hated. If I'm hated for Jesus Christ... Now, if I get hated for doing something stupid, that's on me. You know, some Christians do some very stupid things and then they want to scream, religious persecution, you know, and I'm being persecuted. No, you're being persecuted because you were, you were full of self and you were full of pride. Not because you were trying to share the love of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're trying to share the love of Jesus Christ and you're keeping a good Christian testimony and you get persecuted, then you know what you can do? You can turn that cross in for a crown one day. And God will put that on file. In other words, when you stand up in front of the Lord, the Bible mentions it as a crown of life over in the book of Revelation. A martyr's crown. And so taking something joyfully and taking it with the right attitude and taking it with praying for our enemies, that's what uh, Jesus taught and that's also what Paul taught because he said, look, love is the fulfilling of the law. You just need to love your neighbor as yourself. Someone who says something or does something against you, you need to put your big boy britches on. Instead of just pushing back, you need to say, you know what? They don't have the truth. They don't have Jesus Christ. They are deceived. They are lashing out. I need to pray for them. I need to try to give them the truth. And maybe God will use my testimony for them. I've read countless testimonies of martyrs, not just 
back in the dark ages, I'm talking about 40s, 50s, 60s, up in the 80s and 90s, and even recent testimonies of just three and four years ago and over in uh, India and different countries of people being persecuted and they have pity and compassion on those that are persecuting them. God gives them that grace. What do you need to do? Follow right examples? We have some great examples. And we need to make some new paths out of the old paths. Here's young Timothy, and he's following in the old path, but he's also cutting his own way. He's also making his own path from a child. He's known the Holy Scriptures, and he's following, he's following Paul. It's kind of like those wells back in the Old Testament. Remember Abraham digged all these wells. The Philistines came behind Abraham. What do they do? They filled him in with dirt. What does Isaac do? Isaac comes behind him and says, No, this is what my father worked so hard for. I'm going to dig these things back out. So he dug them back out and he called the name of them the same thing Abraham called. They're new, but they're old. Here we are in 2020 preaching a 1611 Bible. Over 400 years old. That's crazy. <laughs> That's an old path. That's an old well. But boy, it sure is putting out some fresh water. Amen. And so that's the idea. The idea is just to keep doing right. No matter what, everything keeps falling down. It's kind of interesting. And in some sense, in some kind of uh, weird sense, just like as Christians, whenever we face death, we kind of seem weird too because we're kind of like, you know, praise the Lord, here we go. That's how, the way we get to cross over into eternity. So we should look at it and expecting it and kind of anticipating it. That is completely contrary to survival instincts of the flesh. But a New Testament Christian also, when he sees things that we are so comfortable with, our great country that we're so comfortable with, we see things breaking down, there should be a little bit of excitement. You know, hey, uh, maybe things are getting moving up pretty quick. Yeah, maybe we start hearing some trumpets. Some trumpets going off. You know, let me start doing my rapture practice. <laughs> it ought to excite us. Instead of infuriating us, there's that old Adamic nature that says, I want it to go back the way it was. I was comfortable where we had it like this and like this. Well, God doesn't want you to be comfortable. He wants you to live expecting Jesus Christ to come back and to be a good testimony for Him. That's what He wants us Amen. to do. Amen. Now, finally, we need to, verses 16 and 17, stand on the promises. If there ever was a time Christians need to get back to their Bibles, I think now's the time. We have the technology and we have the world inundating us, trying to keep us updated, trying to get our attention, always grabbing for our attention, vying for our attention, pulling us in this direction or that. you got to stay updated. you got to check on so-and-so. Somebody's sending you a picture. Somebody's texting you. By the way, a text is not a phone call. I know I say that from time to time, but it's not. You have an emergency. You don't just, you know, help, help, I'm dying. You know, their phone could be sitting over there and they're sitting there watching a game or something. Pick up the phone and call them. Amen. Amen. But we have all this stuff going off, all this stuff pulling us where we don't just shut it off and take time with the Scriptures. We've got to learn to stand on the promises. We have all Scriptures given inspiration of God. Thank God for that. But notice it's not just pure. It's profitable. It's profitable. God's given you the Word of God to do something in your life. It's kind of like a mirror, you know. Here's this mirror. And the Bible says in the book of James, this is a mirror, right? Now here you have your mirror, and you've got your mirror in front of you, and then you notice, a, you know, you're getting ready, you know, like I have to spend a lot of time on this to do. It takes a lot of work to get it that shiny. Um, <laughs> you're working on that thing, and then you see a little smudge on the mirror, so you start working on that mirror, and you, you see this no little smudge, you know, and... And then you're, 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 you're getting the mirror all clean. You can't look at the smudge on the mirror and then look in the mirror at the same time. You can't look on the mirror and in the mirror at the same time. Does that make sense? God has given us a Bible so that it might effectually work in us. You read your chapters and you got your chapters read for the day. What verses did you read? Uh, where am I at? Uh, I forgot. Okay, what good did it do you? It's supposed to be profitable. 
So if we're going to stand on the promises, notice, first of all, and thank God we have information. He says, for doctrine. We've got to learn what's true. He says in 1 Timothy 4, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. 1 Timothy 4, 16, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. We're going to stand on the doctrine. We need to know what's right and what's not. We need to know what's true and what's error. So we understand we have to have the facts. We have to have the doctrine. We don't have to go there here. There's a lot of places they're not going to stand on doctrine. And therefore, their whole foundation begins to crumble. We are going to stand on doctrine. But notice also, it's not just doctrine, it's reproof. We not only learn what's true, but we learn where we are wrong. This is where it begins to affect you. In other words, I want to study the last days. I'm going to read about the last days and how bad they are. Did you notice as we work through this how much it was focusing on us? We're all talking about how bad they are. Oh, they're disobedient. They're a bunch of rebel rousers. They're proud. They're boasters. They're disobedient. A bunch of sodomites. Then he starts getting down in and he gives instruction for Timothy on what he needs to do. Because if you read the Bible and all you can see is what everybody else needs to do and you don't see any reproof for you, what good is it? God gives you the information to help us. And so we have doctrine. We have reproof. We have correction. How to get right. In other words, God just doesn't tell you how bad you are. And sometimes he does that. He's like, you sorry, dog. And you're like, yeah, I'm sorry, dog. He not only tells you how much you've gone astray, but he, how, he tells you how to get back on the path. He tells you where you went wrong and where you messed up so you can confess up and get right. So to correct something. You're going down the road, you know, and you're eating your Chick-fil-A or whatever, and you start going off the road. Or, Lord forbid, you're texting or doing something you ain't supposed to do, and you start going off the road, and you hear the... Nya, 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 nya. So, immediately, you correct. You make a correction. There's something pointed out. There's a noise. There's a sound. The car's about to flip. So, then you correct. A correction is made. Don't just listen to the reproof and get beat up. You don't need beat me up preaching. And I can do it. I've done it before. I've heard it before. The devil gets in, beat me up preaching. And what the devil does with harsh preaching as opposed to hard preaching, harsh preaching, preaching condemns you and brings you all the way down there and doesn't give you any way out. And the devil loves that kind of stuff. He loves to condemn. The Bible says, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. The Holy Spirit will reprove you for the reason of correcting you so you can get it right. So as you go through life and you're trying to do right and you have all this stuff around you, God gives you a book, He gives you the truth, and then He reproves you, shows you where you're wrong. It's not just your brother and your sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, and now what am I going to do about it? Then God tells you, here's some things you can do about it. Correction, and then he says instruction. So we have information, we have instruction. Look at this, in righteousness. How to live right. And then verse number 17, the intention behind this. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. The Bible says that Noah walked with God. Have you read about Noah's day? Talk about perilous times. Every imagination of man's heart was only evil continually. I mean, I know it's bad now, but in Noah's day, the Lord finally got to his point and he says, I'm done. Then he saw Noah and he says, well, I guess I won't be done with him, but I'm done with everybody else. But Noah walked with God. The Bible talks about Enoch, the same thing. Enoch walked with God, even though it was a wicked and perverse generation. We need to focus on eternity and walk with God because God has given us this book so we can walk in righteousness even in the junk. But you've got to take heed when the Holy Spirit tells you and gives you that reproof and says don't meddle in the madness. You need to withdraw. They call it out in the world. Don't they call it toxic relationships? <laughs> Who's a toxic? They're just toxic. Why, why do you still have your, their phone and your, your their number in your phone? Why are you still talking to them? Because you drivel in the drama. If that's even a word, meddle in the madness. 
People like it. They become even, you know how sometimes sick people don't want to be well because they've then got so used to the sickness, they've gotten to a point to where they now feed off of the self-pity and they feed off of feeling bad for themselves. That wicked heart, that pride and that wickedness is there no matter where you turn. So when God the Holy Spirit reproves you and says, here's how to correct it, don't shove and shrug him off. Listen to him and correct it because trouble is coming. There's a bronze medal in the British Museum that bears the inscription, To Diocletian, who destroyed Christianity. If you know anything about Rome, that's AD 303 to 312, the ten persecutions you read about in the book of Revelation in uh, history. Now think about that. To Diocletian who destroyed Christianity because that was what he was supposedly doing. He didn't destroy Christianity. Let's look at this one verse and we'll be done here in the text. Verse number 9. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. The Lord's got all this under control. And as things get worse, we as believers need to respond in the right way. I think the trouble we have as Christians in Christianity... If you study the mainline denominations, when you got to America and you had the American Revolution, a lot of things changed. A lot of the states like Massachusetts and others, they tried to set up church states. Maryland, of course. Even in Louisiana and different things, you had uh, a lot of pull from state churches. Even as late as the 1770s and stuff. But when you finally had the break with the American Revolution, you had the break from church and state. But a lot of those churches, the Anglicans that were over here, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Orthodox, of course, Catholics, a lot of those groups that were still over here, they, of course, fed the evangelical movement, which you know branched out, of course, with the Baptists and the uh, Quakers, Mennonites, Congregationalists, those kind of things, and, and so forth, even non-denominational groups. To get, they, they bled out of those groups. But what happened is you had a mindset of people who, in their mind, the church was tied into the state. So therefore, the law and everything were decided, not just by legislators, but by the priests and by the bishops and so forth. And so they had a say religiously in what took place socially. And then when you had the freedoms in America and so forth, and you had the liberties to be able to exercise your right to vote and all those kind of things, that, I believe, took another turn and actually was accented even in a situation where you had a separation of church and state because you still have the post-millennial idea, which is this idea that we are bringing in the kingdom by way of Christianity. And so therefore, it does matter that I'm putting the right people in the office. It does matter that we're passing these laws against immorality because we are setting things up for Jesus. That mentality is still very wild, widespread among quote-unquote Christian people. And therefore, when you begin to see the world crumble, you tie it into your ministry and your method, and you as Christians, as Bible believers, you've got to see that you're a heavenly people, not an earthly people. Yeah. This world is not our home, including the good old U.S. of A. Amen. And that's hard for us to grab, I think, sometimes. But I think the Lord puts us in a place where we'll have to make a decision between following Jesus Christ or getting caught up in the craziness. So let's try to have a good testimony as we work through this and stay in prayer about it. Lord, thank you so much for the scriptures. Lord, I know that... This Bible always is...